Good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning at Open Door Bible Church, West Ossipee, New Hampshire. We are in Romans chapter 7. Uh, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about our relationship with the law, with the commandments. Uh, and it will be an interesting chapter as it unfolds. So we'll start with the first three verses. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband for as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. This is not a chapter on marriage. What Paul's trying to do is explain to you in terms that we will get that there are some things that are only apply to us as long as we are alive. Uh, there's many things I care about while I'm alive. I'm not going to care about those things when I'm dead. They're going to become unimportant to me. So what Paul wants us to deal with is this idea of the law. He tells us in verse 1 that the law has dominion. That's an interesting word. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, Paul tells us, you are not under the law, but under grace. After the discussion in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23, regarding the practical implications of this, he now explains more completely how it is that we are no longer under the dominion of the law. The Greek word for dominion is affected by how this verse is written. So I want you to look at it very carefully. It says that the law has dominion over men. Now, that's the English version. In the Greek, the word law is there, but the word "tha" is not. So in the Greek, it would have read, law has dominion over man. It rules us. It controls us. So Paul is making the point that death ends all obligations and contracts. Now, I may have a contract with somebody to pay them money. If I die, they're going to have a really hard time collecting. Because I'm dead. It doesn't apply to me anymore. Now, what I want you to get, let me give you the hint that will make this chapter make sense to you. When he's talking about death, he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. When I am dead, before I am regenerated, before I am born again, I am a slave to the law. When I have been born again, I am free. Now, does that give me liberty to go out and do anything I want? No, but I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer controlled. The law is no longer something I can be beat up with. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He not me. He washed it white as snow. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren. By the way, if Paul is addressing these people as brethren, what are these people? Believers. If Paul's addressing these people as brethren, what are these people? Believers. Christians. Brothers. Christians. Yes. Brothers and sisters. Gentiles. They're not Gentiles. There, Jews. he's talking to Jews, right. his brothers, his family. Okay, remember, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but he was he never stopped loving the Jewish people. Paul said he would be willing to die 
if the Jewish people could get saved. Yeah. This relationship with his people, his blood, was important to him. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead, is that word again, to the law, through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Well, that's some pretty vivid language. You have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Back in Romans 6, Paul carefully explained that we died with Jesus and we also rose with him. Although Paul there only spoke of our death, now he explains that we also died to the law. So we became dead to sin, we became dead to the law. Now, some might think, yes, we were saved by grace, but we must live by the law to please God. No, 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 no. By the way, I couldn't keep the law before I was saved. Guess what? I'm saved. I still can't keep the law. Nobody can except Jesus. Okay? So, This is a principle of living. Believers, us, you and me, been born again, ask Jesus into a heart, been saved, whatever word you're familiar with. We are through with the law. It is not an obligation. It is not a way to get saved. It is not a way to keep saved. Didn't work before, doesn't work now. Nobody can keep the law. Nobody. All right? He goes on to say that you might be married <clears throat> to another. Now, we were not free from the law so that we can live unto ourselves. We are free from the law so that we can be married to Jesus and that we can bear fruit to God. What's fruit look like? Obedience. Fruit looks like more believers. Looks like us reaching other people. Now he's going to tell us the problem with the law. I got lots of problems with the law. Romans, I can't keep it. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. What are you saying, Paul? Okay, so when we were in the flesh, before we were saved, we were under the law. Because of that, we did not bear fruit to God. Instead, we bore fruit to death. Now, Paul makes this statement, and this is one of the few places you'll find him talk about this, says the law aroused the passions of sin within us. There's a really complicated statement. Uh, and then he talks about to bear fruit to death. Paul will explain this problem of the law more fully in verses 7 through 14. But now here we see the point that we only come fully to the place of bearing fruit for God when we are free from the law. All right, verse 6. All of this will make sense. I'm, I'm building something here. Stay with me if you're confused at the moment. Verse 6. But now, right now, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should live in newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He's talking about the letter of the law. Paul is now summarizing his theme given in the first five verses. Because we died with Jesus at Calvary, we are dead to the law 
and delivered from its dominion, from its hold over us, by the principle of justification. Now, I can tell you some things. I can't explain those things to you. I'm not smart enough. When I get to heaven, I'll be able to explain them. But as Jesus died on the cross, as he shed his blood to pay for our sins, there is a way, there is a fashion in which we died with him. And when he was resurrected from the dead, we were resurrected with him. Today we picture that by baptism. Baptism pictures the death when you go under the water and are buried and the resurrection when you come up out of the water. By the way, we're doing a baptism this week. Baptism doesn't make you a better person. It makes you an obedient person. It makes you a person who has pictured what Jesus did. You know, baptism doesn't give us some kind of special grace for living. It doesn't make us holier. It makes us obedient. All right, so we're going to be delivered from the law. Why? Verse goes on and says, so that we should serve in newness of the spirit. Our freedom is not giving us so we can stop serving God, but so that we can serve him better. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be serving him. We're supposed to be doing it in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So here's the question. How well do we serve newness in the spirit? It is a shame that many serve sin or legalism with more devotion than those who should serve God out of this newness of the Spirit. It is unfortunate when fear motivates us more than love, as it should. Now, I'm going to do the first part of verse 7, and then I'll do the second part. So the first part of verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? If we follow the train of thought, we can understand how someone might infer this. Paul insisted that we must die to the law if we will bear fruit to God. Somebody must be thinking by now, surely there is something wrong with the law. He talks about that in the rest of verse 7. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So if we're trying to understand what the law is and how the law works, the example I have for you this morning is an x-ray machine. We've all been x-rayed at some point. If you're flying an airplane, you get x-rayed all the time. So. An x-ray machine reveals what is hidden. It can't blame the x-ray machine for what it sees. It just sees what's there. Okay, you know what the law does? It shows me that sin is right here. It makes me aware of it. It puts a name to it. Now, have I always been a sinner? Yeah. Were people sinners before the Ten Commandments were given? Yeah. But now we get a name for it. Thou shalt not fill in whatever your weakness is. So Paul goes on and says, For I should not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Now he might have been doing it, but he didn't know what to call it. He didn't know why he shouldn't do it. So, and I've used this analogy before. The author I was studying would use the same analogy. It's like a speed limit sign. I don't know I'm going too fast until I look at the sign and compare it with my speedometer. The sign is usually the lower number. <coughs> Not everybody got that. <laughs> you got it. All right. Uh, folks, it's to make me aware of what's going on. I mean, the guy comes up behind me with the blue light going on his car and I goes over and he says to me, did you know you were speeding? Nah. I'm just driving. Yeah, but the sign said, oh, there's a sign. I'm supposed to see the sign. I'm supposed to do what the sign says. Now, 
That sign has a number on it. Folks, this is a word we don't use much anymore. People hate this word. But that number is an absolute. It is not a suggestion. It is not a range. There is no ISH after the number. It isn't 55-ish. It isn't, well, I can go 10% over before it's a sin. Folks, the number is the number. Thou shalt not. 55 is the number. There's no room for interpretation. There's no ish. There's no range of speeds. It's 55 or you're wrong. It's the law. Now, do not tell me I'm free for the law and therefore I can sin. And speed, that's not how it works. But it's an absolute. It's, the guy says, it says 55 on the side. You were doing 67. Well, that was pretty close. That's in the neighborhood. It's in the ballpark. No, the number is 55. You know what it means? 55. Doesn't mean 57. Doesn't mean 67. It means 55. We need to take the law as the law. All right, so this is what the commandments did. They let me know when I was exceeding the limit. Verse 8. But sin. Oh, sin. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me. It did it in me. It probably did it in you. Produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, Sin is dead. So he says, sin taking opportunity by the commandments. Paul describes the dynamic where the warning, don't do that, may become a call to action because of our sinful, rebellious hearts. It isn't the fault of the commandment, it's our fault. Now, let's look at how this has worked in history. Way back when, we passed something called prohibition. Prohibition was supposed to stop you from drinking. Did prohibition stop anybody from drinking? No. It deprived the government of tax revenue. It did not stop anybody from drinking. Any more than us telling you marijuana was illegal, stopped anybody from using it. There is this tendency to want to do whatever authority or government tells us not to do. Now, when I was reading through this, there was this funny illustration. Waterfront Hotel in Florida, multi-story hotel right on the water, was concerned that people might try to fish from the balconies <laughs> and that the lead weights would break the windows down below. So they put up a sign that said, no fishing from the balconies. Now, until they put the sign up, nobody had ever fished from the balcony. Guess what happened the minute they put the sign up? Everybody fished from the balcony, and all the windows down below got broken by the lead weights. Do you know what they found the solution was? They took down the signs, and people stopped fishing from the balconies. Because they would have never thought of it without... Is that not human nature? It is. And that's exactly how the Ten Commandments work. As long as nobody told you not to do that stuff, it was okay. The minute God says, don't do this stuff, well, that must be good. I must be missing something. I got to try that. And that's human nature. Because our nature is flawed. We are sin. Sin is in us. Sin motivates us. So he goes on and says, apart from the law, sin was dead. Now this shows us how great the evil of sin is. It can take something good and holy and twist it to promote evil. Sin warps love into lust. It turns an honest desire to provide for one's family into greed. And it turns the law into a promoter of sin. Because we are flawed. We have a flawed nature. We all inherited that sin nature from our great, 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 great grandfather, Adam. We all got it. Only person that didn't get it 
was Jesus. Why he didn't have an earthly father. That's why he didn't have an earthly father. All right. Verse 9. Listen to how Paul describes himself. I was alive once, but without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, I died. That doesn't sound productive in the apostle's life, does it? Excuse me, it's allergy season. I'll be so glad when allergy season is over. So children can be innocent before they know or understand what's required of them. This is what Paul meant when he said, I was alive once without the law. Now, he is not alive in the sense that the New Testament writers so often speak about it. He isn't talking in spiritual life. He is alive in the sense that he had never been put to death as a result of confrontation with the law, because he was ignorant of the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. When we do come to know the law, the law shows us our guilt, and it causes rebellion, which brings forth more sin and death. It's going to use verses 10 through 12 to explain to us how sin corrupts the law and defeats its purpose. All right, now let's know what he says. Verse 10. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. And it killed me. Therefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. It sounds like Paul's fighting a losing battle here, doesn't it? Like I say, I don't know as he wrote this if he knows how the chapter ends. Or if he's just going through this like you and I have. So he says, and the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. Sin brings death by deception. Sin deceives us because sin falsely promises satisfaction. Because sin falsely claims an adequate excuse. Because sin falsely promises an escape from punishment. That little voice that whispers in your ear and says, God's just trying to keep you from something that you're going to enjoy. And don't worry, you'll never get caught. And there'll be no repercussions. The devil is a liar. He's always been a liar. He's still lying. He's still tempting people into sin. Paul says in verse 11, For sin deceived me. It isn't that the law deceives us, but it is sin that uses the law as an occasion for rebellion. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Paul went on in verse 11 and says, and it killed me. That's pretty serious. Sin when followed leads to death. One of Satan's greatest deceptions is to get us to think of sin as something good. That an unkind God wants to deprive us of something. That all those thou shall nots are just a way of spoiling our fun. No, it's God's way of protecting us from stuff that's going to hurt us. But we don't see that. It's like when you sit the little kid down and try to explain to him why he can't play in the street. But I want to play in the street. My friends play in the street. I'm not going to get hurt in the street. The kid goes out on the street and gets flattened by a truck. You know, there's a reason parents tell kids not to play in the street. Not because they're trying to spoil their fun. Verse 12. Therefore the law is holy. Paul understands how someone might take him as saying that he's against the law. He isn't against the law at all. 
It is true that we must die to sin and we must die to the law. But that should not be taken to mean that Paul believes that sin and the law are in the same basket. Folks, the problem is not in the law. The problem is in us. It's always been in us. <clears throat> All right, he goes on to explain how the law works. Verse 13. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Paul's looking for the worst word he can find to describe sin. The only way he could make it sound worse was to talk about it being exceedingly sinful. So he starts off, sin that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So the law provokes our sin nature. This can be used for good because it more dramatically exposes how deep our sinfulness really is. After all, if sin can use something as good as the law to its advantage in promoting evil, it must be really, really evil. We need sin to appear sin. Sin always wants to hide in us and conceal, I get this, it wants to conceal its true depths and its true strengths. This is one of the most deplorable <coughs> results of sin. It injures us most by taking from, the, taking from us the capacity to know how much we are injured. It undermines the man's constitution and yet leads him to boast of unfailing health. It makes him poor, but lies and tells him he is rich. It strips him of everything that he needs. The law, theref law therefore, is the grand instrument in the hands of faithful ministers to alarm and waken sinners. I can tell you about the law. I can tell you what the law says is bad. I can say to you, yeah, but you're all doing that stuff and you shouldn't because you're sinners. I can use it as a teaching tool. But man, this is hard to deal with. He went on to say, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. He wants us to understand how bad it is. Now, he could have said, it's extremely black, it's extremely horrible, it's exceeding deadly, but he was looking for the worst word he could find to warn us, and the only word he could find that would do that was sin. So he says it's going to be exceedingly sinful. All right, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. That's not what Paul says. But I am carnal sold under sin. The word carnal simply means of the flesh. Paul recognizes that a spiritual law could not help a carnal man. Now the word in Greek for carnal meant characterized by the flesh. In this context, it speaks of the person who should do differently, but does not. Sounds like us. Paul sees this carnality in himself and knows that the law, though it is spiritual, has no answer for his carnal nature. Paul describes himself as sold under sin. He is in bondage to sin, and the law can't help him. He is like a man arrested for a crime and thrown in jail. The law will only help him if he is innocent. Paul already knows he's guilty. He doesn't need the law to make him feel more guilty. He already knows. By the way, Scott, hold your place we are and think with me. As Paul writes this, what is Paul? He is a saved, born again Christian. He is in a struggle. 
He's in the same struggle you and I are in. Some of us openly admit it, some of us try to hide it, but we all struggle with the sin nature. We all have desires to do stuff we're not supposed to do. That's what he's talking about. All right? Now, Martin Luther wrote about this statement, and he said this is proof of a spiritual and a wise man who recognized that they are carnal, that they are sold under sin. The proof of a carnal man is that he regards himself as spiritual and is pleased with his condition. So folks are deceived because the devil lies to them and they listen to the devil's lies. Now verses 15 through 19, Paul describes himself. I'm pretty sure he's describing us. I wish that I had an audio recording of the Apostle Paul giving these verses. Because I think what you really need to hear is the anguish, the frustration as he's doing this. Again, I don't know if Paul knows how the chapter ends. I, I, I don't know how this process works. Holy Spirit's giving Paul this stuff and Paul's putting it down. And you know, Paul's living it, and Paul's feeling it. But I don't know if he knows how it ends at this moment in his life. So here's Paul describing his situation. And again, I wish I could let you hear the anguish in his voice. For what I am doing, I do not understand. This is the Apostle Paul. I don't understand what I'm doing. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Man, Paul is frustrated. Paul is conflicted. Paul is burdened. And can you feel the anguish? By the way, that's us. We all have something that we fight against, that we battle against, that we think we've overcome and it comes back and whacks us again from another direction. We all have that struggle. We're all human. We're all sinful. Folks, you don't get through a day perfectly. Now, sometimes we sin little sins. Sometimes we sin big sins. Guess what? God doesn't have a size for sin. Sin is sin. Catholics come up with this idea of big sins and little sins. Mortal sins and venial sins. That ain't in your Bible. Sin is sin. God hates sin. Sorry. Deal with it. Right, Pastor Terry? All right. So, Paul's conflicted. I mean, Paul needs a shrink. He needs a good Christian counselor. And I feel bad for the guy. I'm not even sure I could help him. All right, verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Now, Paul's problem, and for most of us, the problem isn't a lack of desire. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that everybody who's here wants to do right. He says, I know what I'm supposed to do. I don't do it. Paul's problem and our problem is not lack of knowledge. If I gave you a piece of paper and said, check off the things that are good, check off the things that are bad, you'd all know where to check. I don't need to teach you what's good. I don't need to teach you what's sin. You know that. Paul knew that. He just didn't know how to make it work. That's the same thing we struggle with. 
He says, how to perform what is good, I do not find. It's not that he lacks knowledge. He lacks power. Now, the law says, thou shalt not. The law says, here's the rules. You better keep them, boy. Well, nobody's ever kept it. Verse 17. It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, is Paul denying his responsibility as a sinner? No, he understands. But he recognizes that as he sins, he acts against his spiritual nature as a new man in Jesus Christ. Christians must own up to their sins, yet realize that the impulse to sin does not come from who we really are in Jesus Christ. It comes from the flesh. It comes from the old nature. Folks, I'm going to have that till I make it to heaven. I'm going to struggle against it. I'm going to do better some days than others. I'd like to hope a year from now I'm doing better than I am right now. I'd like to hope I'm doing better than I was a year ago. But it's a battle. It's never going to be over. Don't come and ask me how to get out of the struggle. None of us are getting out of it alive. We just got to fight the good fight. We got to understand what to do. To be saved from sin, a man must at the same time own it and disown it. Well, it is a confusing statement. It is a practical paradox which is reflected in these verses. Now, I want you to listen again. I'm going to read verses 18 and 19 again. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Folks, that's us. First Paul does what is not desired. Shame on you, Paul. Uh, now, he says, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. So let's measure Paul's words against his life. Had not Paul done much that he desired to do in obedience to Christ? Had he not suffered greatly for the sake of the spread of the gospel, nearly losing his life on more than one occasion? Certainly there is evidence that Paul did much of what he wanted to do. So what about his words? He is speaking of the sinful capacity that lives in him still. If we were up to Paul, or if it were up to us, we would do only good stuff. Yet we keep doing the opposite. Paul does not mean that he does only evil, or that he does more evil than good, but that the conflict with evil is one that keeps on. It is at present active in his life. The lure of sin is not dead, though we have died to it. It will not die during our lifetime. Only in the age to come will we be free from doing those things which we ought not to do. Not only does Paul do what is not desired, he does not do what is desired. Again, sounds like us. We have good intentions. So in verses 20 to 23, he's going to continue with this, dealing with this battle between the two selves, between my spiritual side and my carnal side. Verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law. That evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, law of God, according to my inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. 
So he talks about, in verse 20, sin that dwells in me. Paul repeats his words from verse 17. Believers still have a sinful nature that pulls them to do what they do not want to do. The seeming contradiction of, I want to and I don't, I shouldn't, but I do, emphasizes how difficult it is to live the Christian life. One way to think of it is, until I was under the grace of God, sin only. That's, that, that's easy. After I was under the grace of God, I admit that I still own sin. Before Christ, before being saved, I was responsible for being a sinner. Once Christ saved me, I am still responsible for my sins. But this in no way excuses my sins. I still have to repent. I still have to turn around and keep going back towards God on a regular basis. Uh, I give you a law in verse 21. I find then a law that evil is present with me. That's true of all of us. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but that's true of all of us. We still have that tendency to sin. Some of us control it better than others. Verse 22, he says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. That spiritual part of me understands the commandments are right and understands I shouldn't do that stuff. I agree. Bob is my flesh can't make itself do that. Now, the old man, that old sinful nature, is not the real Paul. The old man is dead. The flesh is not the real Paul. The flesh is the old man. The new man is the real Paul. Now, Paul's challenge is to live like God made him, as a new creature. That's the same for all of us. Verse 23, he says, Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Sin is able to war within Paul and win because there is no power in Paul himself other than himself. Folks, I am not strong enough to stop sinning. I am not strong enough to make myself do what I'm supposed to do. Verse 24, Paul kind of puts this all together in one verse. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The ancient word that the Greeks use for wretched would be more literally transmitted, or translated, wretched through the exhaustion of hard labor. Paul is completely worn out and wretched because of his unsuccessful effort to please God under the law. Legalism always brings a person face to face with their own wretchedness. If they continue to live in legalism, they will react in one of two ways. Either they will deny their wretchedness and become self-pious, self-righteous Pharisees, or they will despair because of their wretchedness and give up following God. That's the only two places it can lead. Oh, wretched man that I am. The entire tone of the statement shows that Paul is desperate for deliverance. He is overwhelmed with a sense of his own powerlessness and sinfulness. Folks, this is the Apostle Paul. This is the guy out planting churches. And he's got this battle going on within him that he can't win. Finally, he asks, who will deliver me? Paul's perspective finally turns to something outside of himself. Paul has referred to himself some 40 times since verse 13. In the pit of his unsuccessful struggle against sin, Paul became entirely self-focused and self-obsessed. This is the place of any believer living under the law who looks to self and personal performance rather than looking to Jesus. The words, who will deliver me, show that Paul has given up on himself. 
He is now looking for a deliverer. When Paul describes this body of death, our old man, some commentators see a reference to the custom of ancient punishment. The most terrible thing you could do to a guy who was a murderer, you would take a dead body and tie it to him back to back. And he would have to carry that body around as it decayed. That's how Paul felt. I'm lugging around this old dead body with me. And I can't get control over it. All right. Pastor Terry, are you uh, ready to whip back there? This is the whooping it up verse coming. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He's saying the victory is in Jesus. Amen. Paul finally looks outside of himself. He looks to Jesus. As soon as he looks to Jesus, he has something to thank God for. And he thanks God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now when Paul uses the word through, it means Paul is looking and he sees Jesus standing between himself and God, bridging that gap, providing a way to God. When he uses the word Lord, Paul has put Jesus in the right place as Lord and Master of his life. He says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, or with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul acknowledges the state of struggle, but thanks God for the victory in Jesus. Paul doesn't pretend that looking to Jesus takes away the struggle. Jesus works through us, not instead of us, in the battle against sin. Amen. The glorious truth remains. There is victory in Jesus. Amen. Jesus didn't come and die just to give us more or better rules, but to live out his victory through those who believe. The message of the gospel is that there is victory over sin, hate, death, and all evil as we surrender our lives to Jesus and let him live out his victory through us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Paul shows us that even though the law is gracious and good, the law can't save us. We need a Savior. Paul never found any peace, any praising God, until he looked outside of himself and beyond the law to his Savior. Now, you thought the problem was that you didn't know what to do to save yourself. But the law came as a teacher, taught you what to do, and you still couldn't do it. You didn't need a teacher. You needed a Savior. So many churches today are trying to give people teachers instead of introducing them to the Savior. You thought the problem was that you didn't know yourself well enough. Huh. But the law came in and like a doctor perfectly diagnosed your sin problem. The law can show you your problem. The law can't heal you. The law can't make you well. The law can't make you whole. Now, I take, I don't agree with the guys who do chapter markings in the Bible Chapter markings are not inspired. I believe verse 1 of the next chapter has to be part of this story. That's right. I can't leave you where you are. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I'll do this verse again with the chapter next week, but I got to do it here. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. That's Paul's answer. Amen. At the end of chapter 7, Paul assured all believers of having power to overcome sin. And he gave us the assurance of final deliverance from this evil world. But he included the reminder that during this lifetime, there will be a constant tension because of the sinful nature. Even a believer is a slave to the law of sin. So the question arises, 
How are we to spend our entire lives defeated by sin? We are. In chapter 8, Paul described the life of victory and hope that every believer has because of Jesus. With the suddenness of Pentecost, Paul begins his description of the victorious Christian life, referring repeatedly to the Holy Spirit. Now, in this whole chapter, Paul only mentioned the Holy Spirit twice. In the next chapter, he mentions him 19 times. There's a change in where the emphasis is. There's a change to direct us towards where the power is. We must be aware of our need for the Holy Spirit. That's what this chapter did. Paul proved to you, you can't do it. I can't do it. We all struggle. We're all going to fail as long as we're doing it in our power. We need to do it in God's power. So, the Holy Spirit's presence and power answers the despair of chapter 7. The law of sin won in chapter 7. It's defeated in chapter 8 by the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. It is victory, but I can't do it. i got to let God do it. I gotta open myself up and let the Spirit do it. Now, again, as Paul wrote this, did he understand what he was gonna write in chapter eight, verse one? Or was he as surprised as we were when he got there? But there was a struggle. And Paul concludes with the answer to the struggle. Folks, we can't do it on our own. We gotta have Jesus. All right, for those of you watching, on the internet, thank you for being with us. Come and visit us. Open Door Bible Church, West Ossipee, New Hampshire, right next to McDonald's. God bless and have a great day.